Dear friends, it really is a great privilege to be here, and to be here in particular. And that is not what we mean. And if that seems obvious to you, that we're talking about a different sort of privilege, I want to say that even in planning this event, Agenda, Agenda Committee did not find talking about our own privilege or lack of it easy, and we caught ourselves falling back on those things that are a little easier to describe. But the sorts of privileges we want to bring before you this yearly meeting are those privileges which can lurk unsuspected in the system of things before they are dragged into the light, as William Charles Braithwaite put it. In the preparation material, we recommended this to you, the Toolkit for Action. And this describes privileges, privilege as the advantages a person can inherit from birth and or accumulate over time, constructed by society and seen where there, there are unexamined power, power relations. Privilege may be seen as the opposite of oppression. So whether we feel we have or we lack privilege, what are those things that we need to move out of the way before we can take action on inclusion and equality? What is holding us back from acting on our urgent concerns on the climate emergency and climate justice? Who are we? How do we live? And what impact do we have? Exploring privilege can be challenging and it can be uncomfortable. We may experience many emotions around our own lack of privilege or our own privilege. We have asked questions in the preparation material about how does this make me feel? What is its message for me? Our challenge is to accept these feelings and then move on to find the actions that they may ask of us. It is through discomfort that we grow. But friends, we will need to be especially tender with one another as we engage in worship and discernment around this theme. We undertake this in order to free ourselves, to grow and to change. I want to say a little bit about our process for considering the theme of privilege and its impact on our urgent concerns over the course of this yearly meeting. We know that there has been much preparation and that many friends and meetings have engaged with all sorts of activities as part of that. But even so, we doubt that we will complete an entire spiritual transformation in one weekend. So our process is aiming to lay foundations ready for later building work in our Quaker communities. We know also that we start in different places and we've tried to create a process that allows for that. So tomorrow morning, you will hear an introduction to privilege beyond the mini one that I'm giving you now. Both tomorrow and on Sunday, we hope to hear a wide range of voices, particularly some voices that may be less often heard. We pray that we will hear some inspiring and prophetic testimonies, whether as prepared ministry or as ministry arising from the meeting. Then the next stage of our process is to give you several different opportunities to worship, to engage and participate, and that will come both in plenary session and in parallel sessions, giving us a whole different range of experiences and themes to explore in more depth. We'll say more about the practicalities of that tomorrow. And of course, there's plenty of opportunity outside our formal sessions to engage with each other. Then we bring all that we have heard and experienced together into worship, discerning what it is that we have learned and understood together and what to and want to take forward. And on Monday, we will consider what happens next, what needs to go back to our Quaker communities, and perhaps where we might come back to at our yearly meeting gathering next year. Agenda Committee felt that the yearly meeting would be well served in considering this matter by hearing stories of individual experience. And tomorrow and on Sunday, we have asked a range of friends to tell their stories to help our discernment. But we've also asked all the friends bringing you other types of reports uh, to, to say one thing about how their privilege or lack of privilege has affected their ability to take action. And since I asked them all to do it, I thought I'd better go first.
When I was growing up, the police came under the category of people who help us. I rarely recall seeing them in the village where I was brought up, except once when my bus broke down and they gave me a lift, and another time when we were snowed in and they flew yeast into the village bakery. Then for several years, I worked in a very large, busy London hostel for homeless young people, young people at risk, and young people leaving care. Many had chaotic lives. Mental health, poor, poor mental health was common. I soon got very used to walking to my office, past a row of police cars outside, or a group of police officers standing in reception, without a second thought. And most often they were there to help, occasionally to deal with crime. Talking to the young people, I learnt about their relationships with the police, their anger or their indifference, their fear of being misjudged because of their background, their skin colour or the way they spoke, and some good techniques that some had learnt to, to handle that. But living in London, I never taught my teenager what to do if they were stopped and searched, or how to avoid that in the first place. Things like not hanging out in large groups, how to stay calm, avoiding sudden movements and describing what you're doing. I'm reaching for my ID now, so that no one thinks you're reaching for a weapon. Despite what I'd had learnt from the young people, it didn't occur to me. But I know now that many of my neighbours are teaching these children these things, especially their boys, and from a young age. My current office is not far from Marble Arch. So on the first day of the Extinction Rebellion protests over the Easter weekend in London, I thought I would go and see what was happening. It was the first day. There was a great sense of optimism. It was a nice warm evening. Things had not yet settled down into a routine there. I asked what I could do to be useful, and somebody suggested going to talk to uh, people on the roadblocks uh, who'd had quite a difficult day getting all that set up. I had a fascinating time hearing people's stories of the day and why they were there. The police were setting up their own operation, and there was a pretty good atmosphere. A police officer came past with a pile of, big pile of pizza boxes for all his colleagues, and we had a bit of a chat and we shared a joke. And I became very conscious of being a white, middle-aged, professional woman, with no fears of being misunderstood, of being singled out for arrest, of being unfairly treated, of having my benefits withdrawn, or having my immigration status questioned. There's been quite a lot said about this aspect of, of those protests, but that's not the moment for that. This is just my story. There are times, and that was one of them, when I could choose to use my privilege to further what I felt was a good cause. But where is the line between using privilege for good and marginalising those who do not have the same privilege? Katie spoke to us a moment ago about being a trusted trusting and trusted community so that we can go beyond our comfort zones and risk vulnerability. When I was thinking about what I might say about my own privilege or lack of it, there were several stories I could have chosen to tell you. I chose one that was about where I have privilege rather than where I lack it. I hope it was reasonably interesting and topical, but at this stage in our yearly meeting, it was also a story that felt pretty safe to tell. My priority this weekend is clerking. But if all we hear this weekend are stories from our comfort zones, we will have missed opportunities for growth, friends. Others who minister to us this weekend may tell us stories of their disprivilege and their vulnerabilities, and may open themselves to us all in order to help us grow. Friends, let's make this a safe place for us all to do that. One of the ways we can do that is to make sure we tell our own stories. It might be what happened to us, or might be how we felt when some challenging ministry was given. Without judging or passing on other people's stories more widely than was intended. We seek to become aware of the unseen and unspoken chains that bind us, 
and determine the permission to act in our lives. Where do we have privilege? Where do we lack it? Can we recognise this for ourselves? How does it feel to examine this together? Can we work together to overcome our fears and move forwards?